All right, he's a madman. Yeah, he's a bit crazy, but we like it that way. A madman, and that is a good thing. It actually, once he's president again, as is my hope, will keep us safer, just like it did when he was president, and just like it did when other people that our enemies thought were a little bit crazy, um, it helps us. There's actually a theory. It's called the Madman Theory, and it came up in the Nixon administration. When a country makes their leader look irrational and volatile, so other world leaders would avoid provoking the country, fearing an unpredictable response. And... Richard Nixon, who was definitely a little bit different, is the guy who got this started. Nixon called it the madman theory. The idea that he would pretend that he hated communists so much that he would get angry and he would do anything to destroy communism and save South Vietnam. And so it was called the madman theory. So he liked to project this idea that he was mad and he would do anything to end the war. This led to one event that we're just finding out about uh, now, at least recently, that Nixon ordered a nuclear worldwide alert. Um, and it was secret until just a few years back when the documents came out. You know, sometimes you can achieve peace by pretending you want the opposite. It's kind of brilliant. So Richard Nixon had it. Ronald Reagan had it a little bit, actually, as well. You know who didn't have it? You know who they weren't afraid of? Jimmy Carter who just put all of his cards on the table. Uh, we want peace and uh, anything for peace, and we do want peace, but you gotta be tough at the same time. Joe Biden doesn't have it, all right? Even though he's losing it, I mean, they think he's losing it, but not in a good way, not like Trump. <laughs> and you know who has the power really right now? Not Joe Biden, not even so much Barack Obama. It's the guys who write the cards. You ever notice Joe Biden looking down all the time, reading? We said an outrage by the uh, explosion at the hospital in Gaza yesterday. Yeah, I made it clear that, uh, that no nation can be truly secure in the world. He's reading those cards, the index cards, like we had, you know, for social studies class, learning the world capitals. This Russian brutality and aggression that we face every single day. But today, I also want to thank you for deepening uh, our security cooperation. You know, anybody could do this, by the way. Anybody. When I hosted you at the White House in February... Give my neighbor the cards. He could be the president. All right, so who's actually putting the stuff down on the cards? They're the important ones. They're running the show. And there are two guys, two prime guys right now. One is uh, Tony Blinken. Lurking in the shadows, that's him, the Secretary of State, been hanging around Joe Biden for about 20 years. The other guy, Jake Sullivan, often seen in the room, uh, off to the side. He is actually most famous in history for advising Hillary Clinton to go to Wisconsin to campaign, and Hillary uh, blew him off. Jake Sullivan, National Security Advisor, in way over his head. We've had some giants in that job. McGeorge Bundy, one of the guys who ran the world under John F. Kennedy. Henry Kissinger, National Security Advisor. General Brent Scowcroft under George H.W. Bush. And now we have Jake, a guy named Jake, Jake Sullivan. Jake is just, I mean, Jake, I'm sorry, Jake is the name of the guy who... Uh, I don't know. He's, he's a great guy, Jake, but he's... <laughs> is it Jacob? you got to use your full formal name for a job like that. It's the little things sometimes. Joe was on Air Force One, surrounded by reporters yesterday. Did you notice this? Um, not asked one question that could, well, embarrass him, undermine him. I mean, that's kind of what the press does, right? And there were real heavyweights there. The New York Times was there. The Washington Post was there. Um, and they tiptoed around. No one brings up the Hunter Biden laptop. You know, Joe Biden has never been asked about the laptop other than that one debate. And he lied to everybody. And still, with this genteel treatment, he just can't get it right. I'm not suggesting that Hamas deliberately did it either. That's that old thing. Got to know how to shoot straight. Wow, that is uh, so inappropriate, so wrong, diplomatically, politically, from a 
just a regular common sense, humane point of view. You got to shoot straight at our ally. He's surrounded by media and they don't say anything about it. They don't say, wait a second, Mr. President, did you just say what we think you said? No, because he has presidential immunity. Why does he have that? He's a Democrat, I guess. Democrat presidential immunity is more like it. Now, when you're president, you get it. And when you're a candidate, even if you're a Democrat, you don't. You know, those same reporters actually had some guts, a little bit, when he was just a candidate for president. Watch this. To serve on the board of a Ukrainian energy company facing serious corruption charges, you were the vice president running point on Ukraine. The average Joe hears that and says, that sounds fishy. What's your understanding of what your son was doing for an extraordinary amount of money? I don't know what he was doing. I know he was on the board. I found out he was on the board after he was on the board. And that was it. And there's nobody. Well, no you've had said, a lot of time. Isn't this something you want to get to the bottom of? No, because I trust my son. But that doesn't pass the smell test. Like, when you're vice president, isn't there a higher standard? Don't you need to know no. what's happening with your family? Don't you need to put down no. some guardrails? Um, um, unless there was something that was, uh, there was something on its face that was wrong. There's nothing on its face that was wrong. So, look, if you want to talk about problems, you know, let's talk about Trump's family. Wow. Nothing on its face that was wrong. Nothing on its face. I counted one, two, three, four, five, six potential lies in, what, 37 seconds there? Um, that was good aggressive questioning. Now that he's president, why doesn't he get it anymore? Presidential immunity, Democrat presidential immunity. Now he's got real power, and he's doing wildly irresponsible and dangerous things. Today, I'm also announcing... $100 million in new U.S. funding for humanitarian assistance in both Gaza and the West Bank. Wow. Um, terribly dangerous. They could easily use that money for bombs, bullets uh, to use against Israel. And the administration, they know it. Any assistance that goes in will be diverted once it's inside Gaza. That there is not a there is not an Israeli military force in Gaza. There's not a UN peacekeeping force in Gaza. The people with guns inside Gaza are Hamas, and so Hamas may try to divert this assistance and keep it from getting to the civilians who who it is intended for. We think that's a legitimate concern. Uh, we've made clear that this aid needs to go to innocent civilians and not Hamas. We're going to be watching very carefully uh, how it's delivered um, because we want to be sensitive to those concerns, which we share. Wow. They're going to be watching it, just like they were watching the, the border between Gaza and Israel, just like they're watching our border. How are they going to do anything about it? Please don't spend that money. Don't buy candy with that money, Johnny. All right. The celebrities are at it again threatening to leave the country if Trump wins. My life seems to be longer than any human being ever, she says. But inside the story, she goes on to threaten she's equally horrified by the possibility of Trump regaining power. I almost got an ulcer the last time, she said. If he gets in, who knows? This time, I will leave the country. Now, lots of politicians, lots of celebrities promised us they were going to do that the last time. They didn't. I'm actually really surprised to hear this, though, from Cher. She should love President Trump. I know a few things about Cher. She supports the troops. She's actually gone out of her way to visit the troops overseas at Walter Reed Hospital. She has helped them. Her heart goes out to them. And I know this is not some passing fancy of hers. She once called C-SPAN, you know, the phone in line? As a regular person, and the guy figured out it was Cher, just listen to her heart was breaking over that Iraq war and the horrible price we had to pay for a lie. And I spent the day with, I mean, they were great guys, and, and the, the, the men that took me around were in the, in the you know, in the services. They, they were fabulous men. These boys had unbelievable courage, and they still said, the, for the most part, they were glad that they did it. They felt that it was their duty. They had the most unbelievable courage, and it took everything that I have as a person to not, you know, break down while I was talking to these guys. But I just think if there was no reason for this war, this was the most heinous thing I've ever seen. So remember that, Cher, wherever you are, huh? Because the people... On the other side, on the left, 
people, I guess, you like, because they're Democrats. Senator Hillary Clinton, Senator John Kerry, Senator Joe Biden. They all, all authorized, voted to authorize that crazy war. And President Trump did not support that war. He said so actually publicly before the war and famously at this debate in uh, 2016. Obviously, the war in Iraq was a big, fat mistake, all right? Now, you can take it any way you want, and it took, Je it took Jeb Bush, if you remember, at the beginning of his announcement, when he announced for president, it took him five days, he went back. It was a mistake, it was a mistake. It took him five days before his people told him what to say, and he ultimately said it was a mistake. The war in Iraq, we spent two trillion dollars, thousands of lives, we don't even have it. Iran is taking over Iraq with the second largest oil reserves in the world. Obviously, it was a mistake. So George Bush made a mistake. We so, can make mistakes, but that one was a beauty. We should have never been in Iraq. We have destabilized right. the Middle East. If you hate war and love peace, Donald Trump is your man. I know for some people he's tough to take. They don't like the style. They don't like the tweets. They don't like this. They don't like that. I don't like getting into foreign wars with no intention of winning and just having them go on and on and on and people get richer and richer and richer. I like making peace, and sometimes you have to make peace with your enemies. This is one of the most beautiful moments in uh, world history. Kim Jong-un and President Trump. President Trump going into North Korea. The swamp said he couldn't do it. You can't do it. You haven't talked to our State Department officials. You can't make peace with our enemies. That's actually the way it's supposed to work. Memo to Mitt Romney. If you were president, you could run things your way, but you lost. Never forget that. And he can't stand it. Listen to this. 20 years ago, people read newspapers and magazines and, and looked at the evening news. Those things were all carefully vetted uh, in, in most respects uh, by editors, fact checkers and so forth. That's gone. Yeah, Mitt Romney is bemoaning the days where we all listen to the New York Times and they set the agenda including saying there are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and we should invade. 20 years ago, that's the way it was. Next. If I have a really crazy crackpot theory, just absolutely, completely wild out there, I can put it out there and get millions of hits. I can get a lot of people seeing it. Well, that was not possible. And, and the people who are influencers, if you will, and have the biggest following are people who are angry and are pointing out the, the foibles on the other side. Has he seen the border lately? Has he seen transgender people hanging around schools during reading hour and recess? Those aren't foibles. Those are issues. Those are forces that are threatening our very existence. It's okay to be angry, all right? It is. Pierre Delecto, that guy knows how to get angry on the Internet, I've noticed. One more. Politics itself has become more of a performance art. I mean, President Trump, for instance, I mean, what is he good at? Uh, his background was performing. He was on TV. He was a WWF owner and, and uh, would go out there with the wrestlers and so forth. I mean, that's what he did, and that's what has given him the prominence that he's received. He really is a fool. <laughs> he doesn't even do his homework. That's all President Trump did. President Trump became famous and became a billionaire by building things, construction, development, taking a vacant lot and going through the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of hurdles to get something like that done, a hundred story building built and doing it all over the world. That's talent. Mitt Romney, on the other hand, can somebody tell me what they did all day at Bain Capital? Uh, I know what they did at the end of the day. Drop the banner, if you will. That's Mitt Romney holding cash. What did he do? Did he build anything? No. Did he create anything? No. He was actually pretty good at taking jobs, moving some of them to China. Building, that's leeching. That's what he did, leeching. All right. So if you have friends or family, anybody who has doubts about President Trump, I recommend they, well, look at what I just talked about tonight. And if they're really concerned, go and find the Mount Rushmore speech that President Trump delivered on July 4th of 2020. It really should allay everyone's concerns. It's a magnificent speech, and it's so American. And I think it's bipartisan, really. Everybody can get behind it. Here's a portion.
This monument will never be desecrated. These heroes will never be defaced. Their legacy will never, ever be destroyed. Their achievements will never be forgotten. Our nation is witnessing a merciless campaign to wipe out our history, defame our heroes, erase our values, and indoctrinate our children. Angry mobs are trying to tear down statues of our founders, deface our most sacred memorials, and unleash a wave of violent crime in our cities. Many of these people have no idea why they're doing this, but some know exactly what they are doing. They think the American people are weak and soft and submissive. But no, the American people are strong and proud. There is a new far-left fascism that demands absolute allegiance. If you do not speak its language, perform its rituals, recite its mantras, and follow its commandments, then you will be censored, banished, blacklisted, persecuted, and punished. That doesn't do it justice. The speech is about 45 minutes long. Again, if you have anybody on the fence or totally against Trump, you got to find this. You can still get it on YouTube for the time being. It has not been banned by YouTube. July 4th, 2020, the Mount Rushmore speech. I hope he gives a similar speech at the convention next summer. We'll be right back.